Four days after New Year's, sources say a casket was pulled from the ground at Holy Sepulchre Cemetery in Rochester. More than two dozen people were at the gravesite. None were family of the deceased. Most were members of the local law enforcement community who watched as the remains were brought back to this world. The person's remains had been laid to rest 33 years ago to the day. When authorities had ordered the disinterment. It was part of an attempt to solve what may be Rochester's greatest unsolved murder mystery. From late 1971 through late 1973, three little Rochester girls, daughters of single mothers with little means, disappeared from their own neighborhoods. All three would be found a short time later. They'd been sexually attacked and strangled. To think that this happened in my neighborhood, within the proximity of my neighborhood, I'm just a few blocks away, that she was uh, uh, picked up. Uh, it just uh, upset me and my wife terribly. And we really wanted to do something about to make sure this didn't happen again. Police would recognize a chilling pattern soon after the second child was found. Victims whose first and last names began with the same letter. Each child's body was found in a town with a name that began with the same letter of the child's name. When police said the girl's deaths could be linked to a single person, the attacks became known as the double initial murders. They started something Greater Rochester had never known, a community-wide fear that a predator was on the loose. The names of the children became household names. Carmen Cologne, Wanda Walkowitz, Michelle Manza. Billboards called for witnesses. A hotline started. Citizens raised a reward fund. Leaders alerted families that children could not be left alone even in their own neighborhoods. I remember as a, you know, basically a child or a, you know, a youngster hearing about it. I remember reading about it. These three crimes really traumatized Rochester. They frightened parents and they frightened kids. And there were a couple of reasons for that. I think the first reason was that it happened not that long after Pamela Moss. Well, Pamela Moss was killed in 1962. She was abducted near her home in Penfield. She was strangled and then she was raped. And James Moore confessed to that crime and uh, was convicted and went to prison. And I think that parents who remember what happened that first time with Pamela, this just basically reinforced the kind of fear that this could happen to them. The first crime had happened out in the suburbs. These crimes were happening in the city. The killings would stop after two years. No one responsible for the attacks would ever be brought to justice. After the case went cold, investigators routinely picked up the file of the double initial murders. Attempts to identify a suspect never made it to court, including the investigation of one of the nation's most notorious serial killers. A generation passed with no suspect charged. There was such a drive to bring this person to justice that, you know, I mean, these were very heinous crimes. Um, and especially due to the age of the victims, I think that gives you more drive that you want to solve it and bring closure to it for the family's sake. And a lot of effort was put in that case. A lot of hours, a lot of, a lot of hard work. And um, to this day, it hasn't really materialized as far as, you know, us giving us closure to it. In the years since, within the Rochester Police Force, veterans passed along to officers the understanding that the double initial murders had been committed by a person that police knew, a local man who shortly after the third killing had himself died. Really that's what makes it a mystery, is that how does someone know three girls with the same initials and why does he come about murdering them and de depositing them in a place with a similar initial. Could the answer to Rochester's most infamous unsolved killings be found in the ground of a Rochester cemetery? One of the things that has brought a lot of cold cases back to the forefront, and this would be no exception, is the availability of forensic tools that were not available to us years ago. Rochester in the early 1970s, a time of change. The race riots of the 60s had fueled urban renewal in the city's most ethnic neighborhoods. Eastman Kodak ramped up to its most robust era. 
The suburbs swelled with people leaving the city of Rochester, but the Flower City was a safe place, a place where a homicide didn't happen every day and was not tolerated. A lot of people had left the city, but many of those people still had relatives and family living in the old neighborhoods, uh, particularly in the areas where these girls lived, the, the northeast side, the west side, the Bull's Head area up on Avenue D. And when a kid disappeared and was found dead, it hit them because these were children just like the children they had grown up with. These were children just like their children. It had been a time and place that allowed children like Carmen Cologne to run errands through the Bull's Head section of Rochester with concern only for looking both ways when she crossed the street. Neighbors remember Carmen as being a hyper child. She lived with her mother at her grandparents' home on Brown Street. On November 16, 1971, Carmen ran an errand to a store where Brown Street meets Main Street on the city's west side, a pharmacy that's no longer there. Police say Carmen went to fill a prescription. When the pharmacist told her the prescription would take a few minutes, Carmen bolted out of the store. The little girl was not seen in her neighborhood again. Dozens of people would see Carmen a short time later. Police reports indicate during that evening's rush hour, Carmen was seen on Interstate 490 West, one to two miles from the Churchville exit. The little girl was seen running nearly naked just off the expressway. She appeared to be screaming and running from a vehicle that was seen backing up toward her. Witnesses told police a man got out of the car, eventually grabbed Carmen and put her in the vehicle. Three days later, two boys found Carmen Cologne's remains in a wooded area off Stearns Road near the Churchville Riga line. She had been sexually attacked and strangled. Garamina Cologne says she locks up the memory of her daughter's death best she can, living near her 10 grandchildren and her two daughters. She has never granted a television interview until she and her daughters Maria and Luz sat down with us. Garamina thinks of the little girl who danced around in orange and baby blue dresses. She sees that Carmen in a portrait that hangs in her home, a portrait painted by a Rochester school bus driver she used to work with, a portrait painted shortly after her daughter was taken. She says that she was a happy little girl, loved to play, loved to exercise, and she remembers the day that she came home, which was the last day that she seen Carmen. Carmen had some little shorts on, little shirt, was smiling and was like, Mommy, um, look at me, I'm gonna do exercise. And she lifts one leg up and the other leg up, and she's like, you see how I'm doing it? Luz Cologne was 11 months old when she lost her sister. On that day, Luz had come home from the hospital with an ear infection. Her mother had sent Carmen to the neighborhood pharmacy to fill the prescription for Luz's ear infection. Guillermina told her father to watch Carmen as she traveled on her errand. I don't know, maybe if I wasn't sick, maybe a lot of things, I guess. Um, I would have loved to know her. I've had a, I would have had an older sister. I think of the pain that my mom feels because I think anybody as a parent, anytime you don't see your child and you think, wait a minute, either at the store or outside, wait, wait, where's my child? And you're looking, you start feeling this, your chest tight and you feel like you're losing everything inside at that moment in time. I think of what she went to three days later to find out that her daughter was found murdered. What made Carmen Cologne's death more stunning was what police would learn as they searched for the little girl that as many as 100 people driving on Route 490 West had seen Carmen along the highway the night she was last seen alive. And she still thinks about it, how Carmen was running and screaming for help. And she doesn't understand how anybody that did see her didn't stop to help her, that she would stop if she seen any child screaming for help. She would stop even if it cost her her life she would know it was worth saving another child's life. I talked to a, an individual who actually saw that happen. And he said, I said, well, why didn't you stop? He said, I was going about 60 miles an hour. And by the time I it registered in my head that something was wrong here, I said, 
I, I couldn't turn around and get back fast enough to do anything. That it would be, it prob very probably had been uh, all over with. But um, he was uh, a prominent person in the community. He, uh, he uh, called me and told me th th of this story, and he felt extremely hurt. And, and uh, he, that he didn't do something, that he couldn't do something uh, to help this girl. Mike Macaluso grew up on Brown Street. He and his wife were raising their young family in the Bull's Head section when Carmen Colon died. He and the organization, Citizens for a Decent Community, hung half a dozen billboards like these around the neighborhood. They asked a simple question. Do you know who killed Carmen Colon? If you lived here in the time of the double initial murders, your memory of that time includes the billboards. We all were young family people at that time. I had a daughter, uh, pretty close to the age of Carmen Cologne, and uh, which uh, set me on fire when, when I heard this. It was, a, it was an awful th thing. The group raised a reward that eventually grew to $10,000. It also started the secret witness tip line. Volunteers manned it 24-7. It was so successful that the RPD would adopt the idea, what we know today as Crime Stoppers. One of the hotline's leads came from Syracuse and spoke of an Hispanic man who'd claimed to have done something bad to the Cologne family. Rochester authorities identified that man as Miguel Cologne. Germina said he is Luz and Maria's father and Carmen's stepfather. Miguel Colon is also Carmen's uncle. After the tip came in, investigators say Miguel Colon fled to Puerto Rico. A six-man Rochester contingent traveled there to arrest him. They did not return with their suspect. But soon after, Miguel Colon surrendered to authorities. Investigators interrogated Colon. They administered a lie detector test. Miguel Colon passed that lie detector and was released. Luz Colon and her family believes her father was targeted because at the time of Carmen's disappearance, he was receiving welfare illegally and panicked. Authorities report Miguel Colon was questioned because he could not be found in the earliest hours of the search for Carmen. The first couple hours that they're doing the investigation when the child disappeared, he wasn't there. But then after that, she, he was there all the time. It still brings tears to my eyes when I see that picture. What a pretty young little girl who never lived to see life. Terrible. Nothing pretty much shocks you anymore. Back then, it was a huge shock because that those things, uh, you know, Yes, they happened, but they weren't, um, everybody didn't know about everything, you know? It was, again, a much simpler time. In that much simpler time, Chuck Stechner was just starting out with the city of Rochester's recreation department. His job gave him the opportunity to provide stability for children in one of the city's at-risk neighborhoods. I was a recreation leader at Avenue D Playground, and um, Wanda, with her sister Rita and her mother Joyce, lived right down the road, and they were there at the center a lot. So although Wanda was, uh, I guess, 11 at that time, mature far beyond her years. And uh, I remember her very well because uh, she was part of the family. You know, all, all, the, all the children there were, you know, we had our regulars, and uh, Wanda and her sister Rita were regulars. Wanda Walkowitz, described by neighbors then as a confident tomboy, she attended school number eight. Wanda lived with her mother and two sisters. Her father had died of a heart attack around her 11th birthday. I know that she was probably a very strong person. She was a fighter, meaning she would fight for herself. Michelle Walkowitz is Wanda's youngest sister. She granted her first interview to a Rochester television station to us, in part so that she could meet the family of Carmen Colon. Michelle was two in April of 1973 when Wanda left school and headed towards home. Wanda paid what was then the Hillside Delicatessen on Conkey Avenue a visit. After coming out of the deli, she disappeared. Two days later, a New York State trooper traveling along Route 104 near the Arondequoit Bay Bridge stopped at the expressway's rest stop on the east side of the bay. 
The trooper found Wanda's body down the Bay's hillside. Wanda Walkowitz had been sexually attacked and strangled. That was one of our little sisters. And uh, just th that, 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 it can, that it can happen, and, and it was that close. So everybody kind of had to reevaluate, you know, their own little lives and what they're doing and, and their comfort level. You know, take a look at it. And like I had said before, it just uh, took away the innocence of the youth. I've always been very curious, and I have no problem talking about it to people, and I'm just very open about it. And that, that makes me feel like this is the only way I can deal with it. She was a very, very, again, strong-willed person. Her whole family is um, very protective of anyone around her. Um, if they were playing in the yard and someone was picking on one of her friends, she would, you know, say, come over here, I'll protect you. Investigators would learn later Wanda had been seen speaking to someone in a car after leaving the deli near Avenue D. Authorities believe the person that killed Wanda took her in that car. It's something that didn't make sense to those who knew Wanda Walkowitz. That's why we thought it was kind of strange because she was very streetwise. There's no one going to talk her into a car, you know, and so don't know the situation, don't know if we ever will, but I know that uh, um, she, was, she was very aware uh, for, uh, of her little environment. She was a, a wonderful person. Um, you know, her life was taken away from her too early. You know, that it should have never happened to any of these girls. It wasn't until after the girls' remains were discovered that reporters raised the coincidence between Carmen Colon's death and the death of Wanda Wolkowitz, whose remains were recovered in Webster. Wanda Wolkowitz, Webster. Carmen Colon, Churchville. It was the media who first picked up on it, that it was, well, here and now we have a WW in Webster, CC in Churchville. And we began to investigate that possibility, but still it didn't really occur to anyone that maybe there was a serial killer. As a matter of fact, it wasn't really that common to consider back in, in the early 70s, serial, serial killer. Well, people organize carpools to take their kids to and from school, or they walk their kids to and from school. They stop letting their kids, in many cases, walk to the corner store. To, to get things. Now, two of these girls disappeared when they, were, when they had just gotten done at a, at a corner store. Rochester lost a great deal, I think, of its innocence at that time in, in the sense that we can't allow our children to do this. A new set of billboards, again placed by Citizens for a Decent Community, called for witnesses to the latest crime, 1973, tainted by the specter of the attacks on the girls passed safely. Investigators continued their work. Investigators noticed notable differences in how the victims were treated before and after they were attacked. With Carmen Cologne, her attacker faced her and used his hands at the time of her death, as compared to Wanda Walkowitz, who was strangled from behind, perhaps with ligature, perhaps even a belt. Now, Wanda had been fed prior to her attack. That was not the case with Carmen Cologne. And while Carmen's remains were found mostly nude, Wanda Walkowitz's body was found mostly clothed. The time between the two killings was 16 months. But the time between the murder of Wanda Walkowitz and the next apparent victim in this string of crimes was six months. Webster Crescent, a dead end off Webster Avenue with the gateway to Rochester's Market View Heights neighborhood. Michelle Mienza lived here with her mother and brother. It is just a few blocks from School 33 where 11-year-old Michelle attended school. Late November 1973, Michelle left School 33 for home. She never arrived. Police believe someone abducted her near Ackerman Street. Reporter Mike Ziegler had been on the job at the Rochester Democrat and Chronicle for just a month responding to police news when the report of Michelle Manza's disappearance came in. Ziegler spoke with neighbors in the hours after the girl vanished. These people were profoundly shaken by what had happened in their neighborhood, and they wanted to do something. I mean, there was one man who lived down the street uh, from Michelle's home, and uh, uh, the day after she disappeared, and this would have been, uh, she disappeared on a Monday, so the Monday after Thanksgiving, so this was a Tuesday, when he drove to and from work, he said that he looked into every car that he passed 
because he figured that whoever had Michelle, if she was still alive, would have to be trying to move her somewhere. And he was hoping that he would just somehow, he would be able to see her and be able to call the police and let them know, I just saw Michelle. Of course, that never happened. We always have said, you know, it's not gonna happen in our neighborhood. Well, when the third victim was found in close proximity to where the other two had been found, um, it, it scared the community into recognition that we've got a, someone out there that uh, is deranged and is using, you know, innocent children as their, their victim. And uh, it scared a lot of people, a lot of people. Richard Piscotti is the sheriff of Wayne County. Piscotti was a young Wayne County Sheriff's investigator then working in Newark the day Michelle Manzo's body was found along the side of a rolling rural road two days after she disappeared. Either they wanted the deceased found immediately because of the amount of traffic that, I mean, it's not a, a, a highly traveled road, but uh, there is, you know, quite a bit of traffic on it. Uh, or the other reason was that he was in fear of getting caught with her in the car. Now her jacket was found about a quarter of a mile down the road. A quarter mile down Eddy Road, off Route 350, the remains of Michelle Manza found in the Wayne County town of Macedon. The double initial pattern stoked the community's fear. Police observed similarities between Michelle's death and the death of Wanda Walkowitz. Like Wanda, Michelle had been strangled from behind with ligature, possibly a belt. Both were found clothed, and like Wanda, Michelle had been fed before she was attacked. Witnesses had reported seeing Michelle at a Carol's Hamburger restaurant in Panorama Trail, where this Burger King now stands. The sighting provided police with their first description of a suspect in Michelle Manza's disappearance, a man depicted in these artist sketches. It would not leave the mind of Greater Rochester either. With fear high and no arrests in a case that entered its third year, amateur sleuths began to try their hands at figuring out the method to the killer's madness. People also tried playing amateur sleuth. I remember uh, there was a lot of speculation about where in the alphabet these girls were. Uh, Carmen was the third letter of the alphabet, and Michelle was the 13th letter of the alphabet. Wanda was the 23rd letter of the alphabet. So people actually extrapolated that out, saying, okay, the next one would be the 33rd, which would be the letter G. So the next girl to die is going to have the letters G, G, and she'll be found in Gates or Greece. So that set people's you know, fears really on fire. People also tried to extrapolate out from a map there was a triangle on where the girls were found outside Churchville and in uh, Webster and in Macedon. So they tried saying, okay, well, if it's, if it's Gates, it will form this kind of a rectangle. If it's Greece, it will form this kind of a rectangle. And people were trying to predict where it was going to go. For all of the leads that had come in over the years in the double initial murders, authorities made public only two suspects seriously considered in the crime. The first, Miguel Colon, Carmen Colon's uncle. He was also the father of Luz and Maria Colon. He is the man investigators had pursued to Puerto Rico. Colon returned to Rochester, passed a lie detector test, and was never charged. They arrested him, they questioned him, they mistreated him. He had a lawyer to prove, to leave, so they could leave him alone. I think she even said they did a, um, a lie detector. She never believed in that accusation on my father, that he was a very good stepfather, that he loved Carmen a lot. Um, and that she just thinks that they just picked the wrong person. In the late 1970s, investigators considered a new right person, a Rochester native, who made headlines on the other side of the country. Kenneth Bianchi was born to an alcoholic prostitute who put him up for adoption in the Rochester area. Adopted at age three, doctors diagnosed Bianchi early as deeply troubled. Bianchi attended Gates Chi Lai High School, 
When he was 20, he enrolled in MCC's public safety program. Bianchi wanted to be a police officer. This was at the time of the first double initial murder. Bianchi dropped out after a semester. He was rejected by the Monroe County Sheriff's Office, and later he was fired from a security job after being accused of stealing. Bianchi moved to California, where he and his cousin Angelo Buono embarked on a grisly campaign of murder that would earn them the moniker the Hillside Stranglers. From 1977 through 1978, they murdered 10 girls and women in the hills above Los Angeles. Bianchi was convicted of killing five of the 10 women in that spree. He was also convicted of killing two women in Washington state, where he now serves a life sentence. Following his arrest in California, investigators of the double initial murders pursued Bianchi as a suspect. It was reported that Bianchi once wrote a girlfriend and told her that he was a suspect in the killings. Bianchi had worked in Palmyra at the time of the double initial murders. To test whether or not Bianchi was involved, police identified an impression found on the body of Michelle Menza. It was tested against Bianchi. The impression did not match. It moved police to eliminate the hillside strangler as a suspect in the case. You get a false sense of hope that you finally got the individual and then all of a sudden things do not materialize, materialize the way they should uh, to bring closure to the case and it's it still frustrates me you know from working out that many years back I mean it's you know it never leaves your mind. Authorities maintain their focus on Miguel Colon as a person of interest in the case. In 1991 investigators approached him again they attempted to take him into custody for questioning. Miguel Colon drew a gun and took his own life. When my father passed away, I remember very clearly two detectives came to our, to our house and asked me if when my father committed suicide, did he say that he killed Carmen Colon? And that, was, that wasn't the reason why he took his life. I wish in my heart that they would find the killer. Why does it matter? 35 years later. One is because it would bring closure. And second of all, it's because for many years they have accused my father. And I want him to be proven innocent. Even though he's not here and he passed away, he went through a lot of torture back in the when Carmen was missing. What frustrates the Cologne family today is that they have not heard from an investigator or police officer in years, not since Miguel Colon took his life. You know, we try and reach out to the families, but we're at that same disadvantage in that many times um, we're, we're hamstrung in, in the details that we can provide because providing details and, and running the risk that details are made public um, could potentially hamper an investigation down the line. Monroe County District Attorney Mike Green was the age of the three girls in the double initial murders when he was growing up in Henrietta. He joined the DA's office in the late 80s. Green has seen the case worked vigorously for half the time it has remained unsolved. Those events, you know, drive you to want to want to get to the bottom of things and want to find out what happened and if someone's out there walking around responsible, you know, whether it's one person or more than one person, yeah, we're going to do everything that we can. They were three little girls living troubled lives. In 2003, the Discovery Channel approached local authorities to inquire about the case. A criminal profiler, Roy Hazelwood, gathered a team of profilers to examine all of the police files of the case. The Discovery Channel probe led Hazelwood to conclude the double initial aspect of the case was more coincidence than part of a pattern. Hazelwood also believes two people were responsible for the killings. It becomes more and more apparent the longer I'm involved in this case that the first murder took place out of anger, anger toward Carmen Cologne, and the last two murders were more what we call in the behavioral sciences as a functional type of murder. This child, this person must be killed because of the danger to me as the offender. Hazelwood concluded the person who killed Carmen Colon, who'd been savagely attacked, left naked in a field and strangled with the suspect's own hands, may not have been the same person who killed the other two girls in the case. Could two different people have committed the double initial murders? It's a theory that measured up 
to one of the most widely acknowledged within the ranks of the Rochester police force, that the reason the killings had stopped was because the person responsible was already dead. Local cops had said for years that the death that ended the string of killings had also taken place much closer to the time of the double initial murders. Greg Policini decided to make a film about the infamous Rochester killing spree in 2006. Policini's movie, Alphabet Killer, will tell the story of the double initial murders through a loosely based portrayal of a retired RPD investigator who late in her career picked up the cold case. We didn't really do that much research. We kind of took the story um, and in our doing it in our own time, in modern times, and just kind of using the, the storyline as a basis. We're not really concerned about uh, the actual happenings back then. Obviously, we're hoping that this type of movie brings awareness to people and obviously help, helping them safeguard their children. To, to know that these kind of people are out there is still dis disturbing to me. Policini filmed the alphabet killer in and around Rochester, knowing that raising the memory of the murders had the potential to raise new leads into the case. To maintain the spirits of the case, Policini called on the same former officer on whose experience the film was based, Hetty Williams. She served as a consultant to the film and also appears in the movie. The one thing that's very important with all of this is that we retain the dignity of the victims and remember that the family members are still in the area. Uh, so it was very important that we didn't sensationalize, that we stayed with the facts. The sisters and mother of Carmen Colon and the youngest sister of Wanda Wolkowitz feel their loved ones have been exploited by the movie. They're making a movie out of it. These are people's lives. You know. She's my sister, and when you bring up something like that, my mom has to go through the emotional feelings again. It's not a distant memory with your family, is it? Not for me. What is it? Para mí yo lo siento como si eso hubiera pasado ayer, no hace treinta, treinta y pico de años, treinta y cinco. She says she remembers it today like if it happened yesterday. It's still fresh for her. The one thing that, that, of course, is common is their age. Um, there were other commonalities as far as family background. Um, the mothers were single parents. They were um, blue collar. It, it, there was mention that, uh, they did mention the fact that they were on welfare, that all three girls were on welfare. However, one of them was not. Um, but they were low income. Uh, some of the other uh, evidence is similar to that was recovered at the, at the scene of the crime. But the difference between yesterday and today in the minds of investigators is DNA. As soon as DNA became available, of course it was talked about for many, many years that there was a possibility of doing this. As soon as it became available, every agency jumped on it. And of course there are tons and tons and tons of cases that get, go unsolved. And initially, um, with the double initial murders, we did not have that. But we did not have enough evidence to submit for DNA testing. But then when it did come about where we realized, hey, we do have this little scrap, let's go with it. Back in 2000, some evidence did resurface. And uh, they have begun re-examining certain suspects. They have been? Yes. As we speak, or, are, you know, Back in 2000, or does it continue? As we speak. Really? It continues to this day. As Hetty Williams was advising the makers of Alphabet Killer, a task force moved to use today's DNA technology to answer their suspicions on one long-time person of interest in the case. On January 4, 2007, sources tell our news police converged on Holy Sepulchre Cemetery. There, with a court-ordered search warrant known as an order of disinterment, authorities pulled from the ground the remains of a man who for more than 30 years had been considered, within the ranks of the RPD, a prime suspect in the double initial murders. That man had died on a snowy morning, New Year's Day, 1974. Rochester police said that on that morning, an 18-year-old woman had been seen walking down Ashwood Drive in Rochester. 
A witness told police that a man who had been following the woman slowly in a car got out of the vehicle, approached the woman, and with a gun, forced the woman into a nearby garage. The witness called police. A nearby patrol officer responded and reportedly came upon a man attempting to rape the woman. The man with a gun who had heard the officer approaching ran. The officer gave pursuit. The man ran to a home on Fieldwood Drive. There, he got into a parked car. The officer reportedly spotted the man in the vehicle, approached, then backed off and called for backup. But before help could arrive, police reported a single gunshot from inside the parked car. Police say the man inside had taken his own life. The man in the car was 25-year-old Dennis Termini. He lived just a few streets away from the place where he died, on Box Street. Termini was a 1967 East High School graduate. He'd gone on to become a Rochester firefighter, just like his father, Ben Termini, who by the time Dennis had joined the ranks, was a high-ranking member of the RFD. It had been Dennis Termini who had been considered a primary person of interest in the case of the double initial murders. Several facts which investigators would not reveal to our news led them to believe that he fit the profile of the crimes. He had been measured against the facts in this case in years past, but no charges had ever been filed. 33 years later, authorities wanted one more look. Authorities continued to expand the use of DNA in prosecuting crimes. Just last year, Monroe County DA Mike Green successfully prosecuted a man based on DNA taken from a string of city school girl rapes. With no suspect at the time of the crimes, he had the DNA indicted. Once the suspect was found in Alabama, he was extradited, charged, tried, and convicted of the attacks. We were able to go back, and based on a hit we got in 2005, um, clear cases as far back as 1993, um, and ultimately prosecute an individual, convict him, and have him serve a sentence that's going to keep him in for the rest of his life. And, and it's, it's always our hope that that's the ideal ending. You know, that's what we hope for, is that we're able to go back and bring justice to victims or families, um, you know, put perpetrators where they belong and close cases the way they should be closed. If it worked for a series of rapes from five or ten years ago, could it work for three rape and murder cases from 35 years ago? Authorities removed Termini's remains. They took a DNA sample. They sent it to the state crime lab in Albany. Three weeks later, they had their answer. When authorities moved forward with the search warrant of Dennis Termini's grave, they were not obligated by law to inform the family, but police did contact the Termini family. For years, they had heard the talk within the ranks of the Rochester Police Department and the Rochester Fire Department that Dennis had been considered a prospective suspect in the double initial murders. Search for the word Termini in a dictionary and you'll find that it means an ending point. Three weeks after testing Dennis Termini's DNA in the case, authorities learned that he would not be the ending point in the double initial murders. The DNA sample taken from Termini did not match evidence found against the second victim in the case, Wanda Wolkowitz. The Termini family chose not to speak with us for this report. The case of the double initial murders would remain open. At least one Rochester family found closure in their loved one's death. We attempted to reach all of the surviving members of the victim's family still living in town. We could not locate anyone from Michelle Manzo's family. Rita DeCan chose not to speak with us. She's pictured here with her sister, Wanda Walkowitz. Wanda's death was discovered on Rita's 10th birthday. She questioned whether finding the person or people responsible for the crimes would matter to her family. Rita and Wanda's sister, Michelle Walkowitz, is glad to have met Carmen Colon's family through our report. She'd always wanted to. Michelle learned Garamina Colon had attended her sister's funeral, had hugged Michelle's mother and wept uncontrollably at the service. Michelle also learned that at one time she and her mother lived just two doors down from the Cologne family in the Avenue D neighborhood and had never known it, never known they had been that close. Michelle visits Holy Sepulcher Cemetery often. It's where her sister Wanda and her mother rest. It is the same place where Carmen Cologne and Michelle Manza and Dennis Termini were also buried. 
does knowing what you know now change anything? Um, no, it's, it's really hard to say um, because we don't know, you know, who, who's still out there. Um, I guess it's a relief for some people, but I never really knew what to think about, you know, about who could have done this to her. Um, but I hope they find out sometime in this century. I feel very comfortable sitting here telling you that no stone is being left unturned. Um, and, you know, unfortunately that doesn't always lead to um, the solution that we're looking for. But, I, you know, I feel comfortable saying that if, if the solution is out there somewhere, we're going to find it. Twice a year, Sheriff Piscotti brings his investigators together to update the investigation into the case. Thousands of leads have come in over the years. Calls spike when the case hits the media. There have been a handful of subjects on which their investigation has focused. We become very complacent in our everyday activities. And prior to those cases being in the Rochester area, I think we, t we kind of took a lackadaisical approach to our children as far as they were playing out on the sidewalk or they were playing in the backyard and you really didn't pay a lot of attention because you, you felt you were in safe surroundings. And that's, those days are long gone. I would like to know. I'd like to know, you know, if we were close to that person. Was it someone that we knew? I'd like to know how it happened too because like, you know, she was um, very smart. Okay, and you didn't trick her or talk her into anything. You know, she was you know, just she was very, very smart. Like I said, I keep repeating, way ahead of her years, her, matu her uh, maturity level. And so to know how, how that happened, you know, was it a person who was in a, uh, wearing a uniform with authority or something like that, that, you know, how did that happen? Um, I don't need to know all the details. You know, I don't, I don't want to know anything about the suffering, but I'd like to know what happened, how it happened. We can only learn from that. After this uh, 36, seven years that these things happened, people should be more the, aware than ever that they have to keep an eye on their children. They just they can't let their children out of their sight. They have to know where they, w where they are and who they're with. It's, uh, it's a terrible thing in this day and age because we've, we've grown to be that kind of a society in this short period of time. Did we ever get over that? I think, unfortunately, we did. And I think that if something like this happened today, um, I don't think there would be as much concern as there was in the early 1970s. And, and I hate to say that, but um, I've covered, in covering the courts for years, I've covered a lot of really horrible cases of, of children being killed. I've covered cases where children were shot to death, stabbed to death, beaten to death, starved to death, burned to death. And they're all pathetic cases. And yet, I rarely hear a public outcry. I rarely hear people say, you know, my God, how can someone do that to a child? It, it, at the time that Michelle and Wanda and, and Carmen were killed, that was a common thought. But now it's it's almost become the currency that children die in horrible ways in our neighborhoods and and it's a price of living in the city and i think that is the fundamental change that we have come to expect that not only of of adults dying in, in street corner brawls or gun battles but we've come to expect it from our children and, and we don't really seem to be that upset about it anymore i hope i'm wrong about it The investigation into the double initial murders is about to take a new turn. While DNA testing has not turned up a suspect yet in this case, we've learned that authorities are prepared to investigate a new person of interest and use DNA testing. Police will not tell us who that is. But what we do know is that a string of vicious attacks against children that took place over two years in Rochester in the early 1970s not only changed the lives of their families, it changed the way we live in Rochester. For our news, I'm Jim Maroney.